Okay, morning everybody. Um, so welcome to this session about 3D audio production or um, yeah, 3D audio production mainly. So you have many possibilities, of course, using different plugins. There are many plugins out there. Um, I'm not going to show a lot of plugins. You'll find them. There's the Institute of Electronic Music at the University in Graz. They have wonderful Ambisonics plugins. They are open source. There's the University of Zurich with the ICST plugins. Also, a lot of Ambisonics tools. Quite nice, uh, easy to use. There are many other plugins you'll find. Um, there are some commercial plugins, uh, including the one by Ircam, by our partner Flux, which is a, a 3D audio. So, so I'm not focusing here on pro audio production. So when you're interested, because I don't want to do publicity in here uh, for promoting products. Um, so here it's an art center and we mainly, so the aim is that you have tools when you want to work with wave feed synthesis, when you want to work with ambisonics, that you can get your artwork done. Um, so I'm showing a easy to set up workflow using Reaper. Um, but you can replace Reaper by Ableton or whatever you want to use. What's your preferred uh, digital audio workstation? And what has been proven even last year when we've done the workshop and we had four studios in parallel. So the concert hall, the two studios here and the theater down there. Everything was set up nearby every studio with a wave field synthesis and an ambisonics array. And we did a lot of hands on. And so when we've been setting up, we've been asking ourselves the question, how should we handle this? 25 people running around like chickens. Uh, everybody wants to get um, hands on time on the array. And we've been using uh, Panoramics as our software for the one reason, because it supports um, nearby every format which you can think of. It's free for Linux, it's not very expensive for the other platforms, and it's very easy and flexible to set up. And the good news is, last year uh, we didn't in include WFS rendering into panoramics for a very simple reason. We didn't have a config tool that you can calculate your filters, and we didn't have time to provide it. Um, now there is at least a small max object that you can, for a linear array, compute or pre-compute your filter set, takes you 30 seconds, and then you load it and you can use in pan panoramics. So, a little bit about panoramics. So the idea, idea of panoramics, I don't know if you know, if you've ever been to IRCAM or such institutions. So we are mainly working on mixed music, um, which means you have musicians on stage, you um, record live, and then you process sound and you put it back into space. And so everything should work in real time. So I'll pref mostly used language is MaxMSP or Pure Data, um, which is a graphical programming language. You've all attended now Rama's excellent workshop on how to patch um, Max or SPAT in MaxMSP. But then there is another world in music, which are called sound engineers, um, who have other problems than patching. Um, so when you do a huge recording, let's say you record using two eigen mics in a room, one for as a principal microphone, so you get 32 channels, one is a, to capture the diffuse sound in the room, another 32 channels, then you get six ensemble groups sitting around the audience, let's say 10 each, so another 100 channels, and very quickly you add up 256 channels on your machine, and then you don't want to do a batch, a PD or max patch for saying, oh, now I need ambisonics, or now I need whatever. So this was the idea three years ago, because our sound engineer has been complaining for a long time. Let's stick the hands together and make something which they can use. So the sound engineer's point of view on spatial audio. I don't want to limit it to the two, sound engineer, computer, music, whatever. Um, just, you know, you can never be sure. They deal with 3D sound system in movie theaters, also in life, uh, for sure. Um, appearing is binaural. TV, radio broadcast in binaural or in object-based formats like ADM or MPEG-8, uh, the new MPEG 3D audio standard. So there are currently a lot of projects at the BBC, at French radio, French television, uh, Norwegian radio, and so on. So Europe is really stepping towards this direction. 
And then of course you have all the 360 degree videos in YouTube, Arte, um, so even big broadcasting chains, cha chains like Arte uh, get interesting in streaming 3D audio content. And we should never ever forget about audio gaming, VR, AR, um, so everything which is immersive experience. Um, of course here, what's the aim, or one of the aims of the workshop, high density loudspeaker arrays, but in concerts, loose, used live, multi-channel sound installations. Um, and then the next challenge is web-based audio. That's appearing. So we want to move everything into a browser, why into a browser? Because you don't have any problems more downloading apps for different operating systems. So as Garth was showing, if you do, for example, with cell phones, like the Cosima project, it was a decision to use a web browser. It was not only saying, hey, we want to use web audio RTC and web audio whatever. Um, no, because it's very nice that people just connect to a server and they don't have to download an app and you can fix problems in the very fast last minutes. That's also not too bad. Um, okay. So this brings us to this variety of um, production workflows. And one is channel-based production. So channel-based production is that you produce for a given format, 5.1, 7.1, whatever. So you know at the time of production where your loudspeakers will be. Because it's standardized format, so when you produce for 5.1, you know that the playback situation is center, left, right, left, surround, right, surround. Zero degrees, minus 30, 30, 110, minus 110. If somebody is not using this configuration, it's the problem of the user, of the client, to make sure that the configuration is properly set up. Um, in sound installation art, uh, what's very interesting, or in general, is scene-based production. So scene-based production, you use a description format like ambisonics, so ambisonics, is nothing else than the sound field, the three-dimensional sound field surrounding you. And more or less what you're doing is, in playback situation, you just project the sound field onto the speakers into your room to play back in the room. With ver uh, variable resolution and accuracy, depending on how many speakers you can set. So it's encoded and, um, at the, and decoded at the, at the client side. And then what we've been showing two days ago, or was it yesterday, I can't remember, the object-based audio, which is the next step. So do you stream more or less your working session with all the information, side information as metadata, and then it's up to the renderer at the client side. So we give more and more responsibility to the end user. And in the client side, everything is rendered, which has the advantage that when I, for example, um, I was producing for a 3D loudspeaker rig, and I have a center channel, and you want to play back over 5.1. You have to make a decision what happens with sound which comes from above. And that's not easy to solve, this solution. Should it be mapped to all the speakers? Would you like to give you the direction, which in terms of content has a completely different meaning? Um, and so that's something you could decide even on the client side. And then, of course, you have, um, when you work in broadcast or um, in a studio, you have this problem that you should produce in 5.1, binaural, um, ambisonics, atmos at the same time, if possible. Um, at least not to rerun a bounce, because that's time and time's money. So you need tools to develop these things. So currently, with this massive multi channels we face one problem. Um, that mixing desks, we all know them, they are quite powerful, but we definitely ran out of I.O. channels. So if you do a live performance with wave into to this and you set up a 265 channel array, it's not so easy to find a mixing desk with 256 input channels, a 256 channel bus, and a 256 output channels. So those come mostly often from broadcast, so there are some broadcast mixing desks where you can have thousands of channels routed everywhere, and you just do some kind of VCA fader for your groups. But for live sound, it's really tricky. And so far, 
it changes or started to change. We do not have a lot of other specialization tools than a little joystick, which allows you to move the sound source around. So on the one hand, we have the need that we want to do productions like you heard, you, you've heard the piece of Natasha Barrett. So you can imagine, she, she's really great in doing these things. And you can imagine how advanced tools you need to pan all the sound sources around in, in this hundreds of sound sources at the same time. So there is a lack of 3D specialization rendering and also in the same lack is there in um, with digital audio workstations. We are very much limited in the buses we can give into plugins. So most uh, all digital audio workstations limit the bus structure to 16 channels. Hey, it's the 21st century, 16 channels is, you can even not record an eigen mic and then send it to a plugin. That's not fair. Um, it was 16 channels in 2000s, so they, they could have made some effort. So we are very limited. Now it's getting better with Atmos because they need more channels. So film industry is pushing um, digital audio workstation uh, software companies. But it's still a problem. And then we have all these real-time environments which give you all flexibility. So Pew Data, Super Collider, Max MSP, or many others. They support up a large number of channels. A recent version, for example, of Max MSP is even not limited anymore to 250. So recently we tried to run 700 channels on one machine without any problems. So that's quite nice. We're getting really into massive multi-channel. You find many libraries of very many different programmers, open source, non-open source, and whatever. So there are very, very many tools. Um, they do not have a timeline. There's no grouping. Um, it's rather difficult because everything you want to do, you have to patch. So you program your environment. So imagine in the workflow of a sound engineer, um, they work on project A, which is very different from project B, and they would have to make patches every time or have their little library sticking things together. So they didn't want this. So the idea was to create something which reminds us of a mixing desk. And you know, in France, we have Asterix and Obelix, so we called it panoramics. So simple things like you want to check if sound comes in. So you need an input meter. That's not very. So a little trim that you can change the gain. Then a queuing section. So the idea was even not to say, you shouldn't do a mix in there. That's not replacing a digital audio workstation. That's an additional layer. So you stream your audio channels in. You stream the side information in like position of a sound source. So all the spatial parameters are outsourced to panoramics. All the mixing parameters stay in the digital audio workstation. Because digital audio workstation work properly. You have all these nice tools to trim and cut and time align and whatever. We don't want to reprogram this. The only thing is it doesn't work as a plugin because we do not have enough channels. So you have to say you send the audio channels and you have then a spatial audio renderer which does the job and puts out the format whatever you want to have as a format. So it's like a plug out, let's call it that way. But of course you, you, you always, especially in life, you need for your speaker setup some EQs, some compressors, phase inversions, all the things you know um, from a general standard mixing desk. But that's the only section which reminds you of mixing this because then we come to the spatial audio parameters like air absorption, Doppler effect, delays, direct gain. So if you think about the room impulse response, sound is coming from this direction here. That's the time axis here. So sound is coming from this direction. So that's the direct gain. Then you pan the direct gain, uh, the direct sound wave into your system. Then you want to use, for example, 3D audio reverberation. So not a 5.1, because when you work in 3D audio, you should use the 3D audio reverb. You don't want to be limited to horizontal plane. So it should be properly done. So you compute <coughs> the early reflections in here. Then you encode the early reflections with all the corresponding um, directions. They will get a gain, they will get filtering, so you can shape a little bit uh, the room, but that's standard parameters which you normally use also in any reverberation set or any uh, reverberator. And then you pan them, you give them a width, 
And then you stick everything together because that's your sound field coming and you send it to a later reverberation engine which comes later on. So this goes to a bus structure which allows you then to decide which panning you do. So on the one hand you have your information of the sound scene plus all the reflections, early reflections and positions. And then this goes to a bus and here you start to decide, am I using ambisonics, am I using VBAP, am I using whatever. And in parallel you get a reverberation bus. Why reverberation in a special or extra bus? Because with reverberation, late reverberation is diffuse sound field. So you can collect all the late reverberations together. They do not change with the source position, at least not in artificial reverberation. And so you can group them together and just save a lot of channels and then send them to the reverberation bus and play them back over whatever format you want to use. So for reverberation in panoramics, we use a feedback delay network, which is a very standard algorithm, uh, which was developed by Jean-Marc Schrott in the 80s, 90s. Um, but it's used in most of the reverberators, which, which are artificial. We do not yet have included here convolution reverb, although it's, uh, it works properly. But that's just because you have to create interfaces and we want to spend our time on audio signal processing other than interfaces. However, panoramics also exists as a max object. So you can use it, for example, for all the standard tasks as a mixer and then you patch a little bit around um, to put in your extra features, um, which is quite nice because you, it's very comfortable to set up, as you will see, and then um, you can put in your extra features in a package. And then you get a bus. So a bus defines the format in which you would like to produce. So we'll then see how, 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 which formats we, we provide, but it's mostly all the formats you find in literature. So in the bus, same metering, EQ, compressor. Um, then you get specific controls to the panoramization you use. For example, in ambisonics, you can decide if you use a mode matching decoder, energy preserving, direct sampling, or whatever. Um, so this depends on um, your format which you're using for your production. And then you have filtering for the late reverberation, uh, which is a perceptual spot model, which I've shown with the guitar and the singer, that you can simulate distance in a more advanced way than just changing direct to reverberation uh, gain levels. And then you mix everything together and you send it to the master. So the first thing I want to show you, um, I don't know if Rama, because I couldn't attend the session yesterday, so how to configure your, in this case I'm using Reaper, I was using this little plugin which is called Tosker, and then just stream the messages. So I'm going to have here my playback machine, and then just to hook it up with a network to stream the audio channels over to the second computer, and then to be able to remote control the source and pan it in ambisonics. And I want just to step once through the entire setup for you, that you understand or that you see how easy it is. Yes, please. Oh, sorry? Have you been coding for the MPEG-H? Um, no, because you need, I don't know how it works if you have to, you have to pay for the encoder and not for the decoder. I guess that's their business model, but I haven't been using so for MPEG-H. Is it on Reaper that you actually do the encoding? Um, no, the encoding is panoramics. The encoding is panoramics, so that's, so let's open a very simple Reaper session. So Reaper is quite nice for spatial audio because you have, a lot of possibilities in bus structures, so it's quite open in all this bus structure uh, routing and whatever. Okay, let's say we make a bus. And into this bus, we just put, what would the plugin? Which is called Tosca. So Tosca is free, where you can download it from um, the forum ICOM website. Um, and it's a really nice tool and very helpful to set up. So to configure Tasker, you need an XML file which gives you all the information you want to have. So there's an XML file which is a configuration file, which is very easy. Make this bigger. So 
So what do you see here? It's very easy, so it's written, okay? Um, it's a Tosca file. It's linking your automation track parameter one to x. x goes from minus 10 to 10, whatever is your interpretation, of, interpretation then of these values. The second parameter is y, and so you get x, y, c. Um, so the coordinates of your Cartesian system. So that's your configuration file. And in the configuration file, you just load it here into Tosker. Oh. Sorry, I was putting it on the uh, desktop. Tosker. That's my mapping. And then I look into the automation parameters, and I see I get here x, y, and z into my digital audio workstation. So I get three automation tracks, and you can do this in any uh, digital audio workstation. So it comes as a VSD, audio unit, AAX, I guess. So whatever format. I'm, I'm not a very formatish per person. Um, so currently the setup is, so what's happening? My automation track is now mapped. So we've been saying in our configuration file, is it still open? Yes. No. In our configuration file, not, come on, come on. We've been saying, okay, map the first parameter from minus 10 to 10. So now it will be here from minus 10. Unfortunately, I don't see it because this always goes from zero to one, but it's from minus 10 to 10. So then one would also go from minus 10 to 10 and so, so on. So I get a cube with 10 meters distances. The next thing is I stream the OSC message here to the output port uh, 4002. I stream it to the IP address 127.001. And the 127.001 is the one we know is local host. So it's the local web socket of a machine for internal communications. So I stream it as a web, as a TCP IP protocol, a UDP protocol, um, into my uh, socket. And then I can pick it up with every program which is listening to port 4002. Uh, OK, so let's try this. A basic patch. OK, so let's first start with MaxMSB. So in MaxMSB, you have the net receive message, um, which just says which port you're listening to. And I think it's the four, no? Ah, uh, no, it's UDB receive. Net receive is PD, sorry. Oh my god, getting old. So you get a standard message here. Oops, I want to need a bang. I should have fired Rama. He's better in patching than I am. Um, and swapping from a French keyboard to an American keyboard is also difficult. So what you can see here, we already get X, Y, C. And if I change, oops, if I change my parameter now here, you see how the value for y uh, for x is changing. So I can stream now my position and data information into maximum speed. So what we are doing is uh, quickly made the basic example. So what I'm doing here is now it's on me to interpret my messages. So what I get is for track one. I get x, y, c into this message. So I first route, I think I should make this a little bit bigger. I first route track one, track two, track three. So when I create a new track, let's do this maybe in repo. So I get a new track into this track, uh, into Tosker. It's the same configuration file. So you cannot have multiple configuration files on one machine. It's the same configuration file. So here I get the same track information. And so now here, when I change my parameter for x, let's say it goes up here, come on. But then you see it changes here. Because the format I get, it's written, so actually it's a I don't know if you're familiar actually with OSC, with open sound control. So it's a very powerful 
media replacement, um, which first of all doesn't limit you to 127 values, which is fair, definitely not enough. And then it's a very powerful thing because it's sent over, um, over the web as a package. You, can, you have wildcards. You can say, OK, change the value x for all my channels, which is very nice when you work with very many channels, and so on. So there, Rama has already shown you, or will show you, I guess, ODOT, um, which is, on, in, once again, interpretation language of OSC, or on top of OSC, or maybe replacing OSC. I never know how to describe it, but it's a powerful, very wonderful tool to, to work with the OSC messages. So here, very simple, what we get in is um, a message which would look like, oops. So one, X, and then let's say 10. So what's happening here, when I route one and two, so I would get a message stream. I, I just use x here, and the second one would be two x, let's say 12. So when I use this message here, then I route, so I get at the outlet here two message, oops, two messages here, which would be the one would be just x, y, c for the first channel. And the second one would be here for the second channel. So that's the second message which I get out here. So the routing does nothing else than looking at the identifier and getting rid of the identifier and forwarding the value. So in this case, oops, in this case it would be that one. And I could have used messages to show it. This would have been easier anyway. And then I route for X, Y, C, and then I configure my messages into what SPAT is actually reading. That's an old version of SPAT, um, because the new version of SPAT is directly using OSC messages. So now, if I, I have too many windows open. So the problem with spatial audio is you not only need many speakers, you'd also need many screens. Um, <laughs> so when I now change the value here for this source, it's not very difficult to understand that it moves in space. OK, but the good thing about Tosca is that it's not a one-way direction. So you can imagine, you get, when you use, for example, add some elevation distance, it's very easy to make a circle because it's straight lines and whatever. So you get very used to interpret the interpretation of your trajectories in terms of three values. Um, I think Bobby is perfect in it. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure. So first of all, you can re-record. Um, so the re-record, I just show it to you in the Max patch. So you transform your messages into the format which you're using in Reaper, um, so in Tosker, so X, X, Y, C here. Then I say, OK, for each source, I add slash source and then the value x, y, c, which I stream to the local host. And what's important is you have to send a touch message. So you know um, in digital audio workstations, you have different um, modes of record. So you have write, which immediately writes whatever comes in. And then you have touch, which means when you touch the fader, then it's written. So since we don't want to overwrite what we've, uh, let's say you've done a trajectory and then you just want to correct it, and you don't want to overwrite what you've done before, you have to use the touch message. And the touch works, you have to send the touch message because otherwise touch doesn't make sense. Okay, so if I now go into records here um, and I put this into touch mode, and I then just go into here, and then I go back to my sources, and we see I move my source around. Let's make this a little bit bigger. And I have my little trajectories recorded. And then I stop it here, I go 
again to read mode, and I can play back my little trajectory which I recorded. Yes. Yeah, sure. We're here to discuss. Yeah. <laughs> so it's two. It's a two-way thing, I guess. It's I a two-way thing. Yes. Just the the, the yeah. only thing is you have to use touch because otherwise you would create a loop. So I do an intro all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looping. No, yeah, I always feed feedback. Ah, okay. It's a problem. It's a problem, yeah. yeah. So that, that's a little bit the problem. Different digital audio workstations have different interpretation of the latch mode, yeah. uh, of the touch mode. But anyway, you had a, so maybe another. So it's basically thing. like, so touch in touch OS in Kafka is, uh, is like the, the creation device. And your DAW is the recording. No, touch is just a message. So um, actually, ah, I didn't say that, but it's a very good question because, you know, the longer you will see, the longer the week gets, the more confused I get. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so normally we plan the improvisation concert with Ok Young at the end of the week because that's perfect. My brain is messed up and we can do improvise. Um, anyway, so you configure normally here. Tosca to send on a port, whatever port you're using. So every device listening on this port receives messages. And then you, the input port where Tosca itself is listening, if you send a message to Tosca, it's received on port 4001. So that's the first thing which is important because since you can use in a network protocol two ports, you avoid creating a, a loop, a feedback. Uh, because otherwise, Tosca would send messages, listen to the same message at the same time, and then you get the little spin wheel. Um, <laughs> so that's good. So the nice thing is, um, when you send, you define the IP address to send to. When you receive, you just listen to the port, and you just wait. Whoever is sending to your machine on this IP address, on this port, you're listening to it. Take care when you're using different computers and you've set up a firewall, and you close the port and you don't receive the message, first look at your firewall if you block the message in the port. But normally, if you use port numbers like 4000 or whatever, you're on the safe side. OK, so when I send a message, first of all, you get here a message which says X because I moved the source. So my uh, visualization tool, so the spot viewer is giving me a message which is saying, OK, I put the cursor on this source, so it's touch, because I'm moving the source. So first I send the touch message to Tosker, and Tosker gives it further to the digital audio workstation, saying, take care, he was touching the source in Max MSB. And if I'm here into touch mode, as long as I stay, uh, as long as I stay in write mode, uh, or in read mode, sorry, nothing will happen in the digital audio workstation. If I stay in touch mode, that's the message for the digital audio workstation saying, hello, something's happening here, you should record. So it's very important when you make your own patches because you have 32 automation tracks which you can use in OSC whatever messages you want to send. You can say, you can send messages like, hello, mommy. Um, and put it on a screen somewhere in the kitchen or whatever. You can, you know, it's not limited to spatial audio. Um, you can control lights, you can do whatever you want to, because some people also control lights. <laughs> um, so that's quite powerful. Take care um, when you are in, um, when you go into the right mode. The problem is when I now record, I overwrite my old trajectories, which is definitely nothing I want to do. So I just want to say, OK, get into touch mode. So touch mode does mean do not touch it. And then I go on and just re-record. And of course, if I'm in touch mode and I start recording, it overwrites. Then you very quickly will face another problem. So I don't know how good you are in video gaming, <laughs> but you have to catch the source. Can you slow it down, like play it in a quarter tempo or something? Um, yeah, you could, of course. If, if the digital audio workstation lets you slowing it down, then you can do this. 
Um, we have to find an, an intelligent way to. Um, so actually, what I what I would do, which I I would just first send a touch message, um, as like with a button. So for source one, then it stops moving around because you touched it already, and then I can grab it with the mouse and, and turn it. Around. So in this simple example, we didn't do this. But you know, you very quickly run into problems like this when you do spatial audio. Um, it's not fun catching your source. Anyway, um, so that's that's quite powerful. But now you can imagine that our sound engineering come back to you just in, that our sound engineering is saying, yeah, it's nice, beautiful. It's nice for you computer music guys. Um, you can do whatever you want to, but I have to do a production and I have one day. So do something which works better than that one. So that's Tosca and I show show you how to configure Tosca in a minute. Sure. I was just wondering actually because your sources in the OSC routes are named in are they sequentially or is it the order packets? Can they be named? I mean uh, the source in in the roots in the OSC routes you have slash one. Ah uh, yeah, that's a track. Two. That's the track number you have. It's a track number. Yeah. Right? That's linked to the track, and here in Tosca is the ID. So you see here for track one, the plugin says it's ID one. I could now give the ID three, and then it would be listening and sending as track three. Because it could be another source of confusion if they say. It is definitely another source of confusion, especially when you have a different order of your tracks, and then you change the IDs, and then you think it's track one, but it's track three there, and there, yep. There are very many possibilities to confuse yourself. Um, okay, uh, the nice thing is. Real quick? Yeah, sure. If you have, uh, let's say you have multiple computers running Tosca that have all have track one on it, would that, you would just increase the port number, the broadcast, so it would be 4002, 4003? Yes, but that's not yet in the cache. Tosca plugin to have multiple ports. So, so far, the plugin is a one way, as a one port solution. Um, because you could send to Tosca multiple ports, mm -hmm. uh, but Tosca doesn't allow you to send it to multiple ports. But if you want to broadcast it mm -hmm. to multiple ports, then what I would do is I would send it to MaxMSB and then just make a broadcasting object there. Mm -hmm. So we keep it rather simple okay. here. Um, and then we wait and if more people come and say, hey, we need this tool, then we put it in there. Because as you've been saying, it's another source of confusion. Um, but of course, then it's your responsibility um, to listen to another port mm -hmm. or to send with multiple computers. But what you can do, you can use your tablet and an OSC app, mm -hmm. and you do not touch your computer here, but you send on the same port to the same computer with the OSC, and you move it around on your touch screen. That's working properly. So you can send with multiple computers to the same port. Cool. Um, yes? Sorry, that, uh, no, yeah, just go on. Can you actually open two input ports for working with two different environments? So you sound with one? No, so far we do not provide two input ports. So it's one configuration file for Tosca and one digital audio workstation. So you cannot say, but you can send with two different devices to the same input port. And it doesn't get confused? No, it's up to you. If I send two messages and the one message says, go do x minus 10, and the other message at the same time says, go do x equals 10, then of course it's getting confused. Okay, so you need to arrange the rates of the back to you to have a concept which doesn't send conflicting messages. Because it's the same. Um, if I say, hey, run to the left, and Bobby's saying, run to the right, you're not knowing what you should do. Um, and it's the same for the program here. So if you send messages which are confusing because they do not provide the same information, then it's getting confusing. What you can do is, so um, I unfortunately don't have my tablet here. So you can hook up over the over Wi-Fi, just a little OC message, um, so OC app, um, where you send XYC as OC message, and then e of o max is running here. You can send it to um, the IP address of this computer to the port 401, and then Maxtress doesn't care, but you move the message around with your tablet. You just have to make sure that Bob is not sitting at the same time at the computer and moving the, uh, moving the source in another pattern. Because then, of course, it's getting confusing. 
And if you want to get more complex, you can use, for example, MaxMSP or PD, which does the same. Um, so the uh, net receive in PD is the same as UDP here, um, to send your messages and to make a broadcasting or to collect messages. And that's all Rama can maybe show you with his um, advanced uh, ODOT skills, uh, which go far beyond what I could show you. Um, how to configure messages, how to regroup messages, how to make packages, how to say, um, I get one message in, but I want to move all sources at the same time. So that's easy to set up in MaxMSP. So you could make yourself a button to say, I send one Atzimut message, and it moves all sources, or it says incremental thing and whatever. But that's up to you. That's, we provide the basics, and you do the higher logic. I you was wondering, will, will you, do you anticipate ever having more than 32 parameters in Tosca? More than? More than 32. Is that <laughs> Sure, if somebody needs it, I guess. I don't know where the limitation, so it's Thibaut's object. Maybe there's a limitation for 32 tracks. I don't know if it's a limitation by the additional audio break stations. Um, or it was just a random number. Um, but best write us and I'll put you in contact with Thibaut and... Seems we're asking Tosca questions. Um, in, like in the... XML, when you set up, for instance, a track prefix, mm -hmm. um, I've not found a way to make a subsection that then has, say, a bus prefix. So yeah, because that's not yet in there. Yeah, that was super <laughs> useful. So I'll show you then. Um, actually, if you don't want to patch how to use this um, very easily with, um, for example, panoramics. And panoramics, the interpretation of panoramics is track one. So here I'm just sending one, so the ID. And panoramics is waiting for the keyword track. So if you want to do so, you get into your configuration file, and you write here prefix equals, oops, uh, equals, this is not a French keyboard. Um, is it slash track? I think it's slash track. So I load it in here. <clears throat> and so if I look now into my Maxims P here, and I had a print message somewhere. Yes. Received. Then I'm sending not one and two anymore, the prefix is sending track one, track two, track three. The problem is just a scaffold thing sometimes because that's the little fix we had for panoramics because that's the OSC message structure which corresponds to panoramics. And then of course if I want to now send other messages they would also have to prefix track and it's not yet implemented that you say um, it's getting, so the first one is getting track one, track two, track three, and whatever, and then bus one, bus two, um, that's not yet done. What I normally do is then, again, I make my little helper patch and say the first 15, tra 15 OSC message tracks get a prefix track, and the next 16 get bus or whatever. Oh. Right, but that could be the only reason to open Max sometimes. Yeah. Like, you know, so then you Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. we are just... Um, <laughs> Um, how to say, just give us more um, developers, <laughs> <laughs> um, then it would be done. Um, the problem is that we have to really always focus on one part, as you've learned when you're here, because when Gars came as, as an artist in residence, we've been saying, as long as you're not asking questions, we'll not do anything. Um, because we just forget about you being here. Sorry, but uh, that's the way. And so I think the first week you've been a little bit, nobody's here and what's with my project? I said, if you want us to do something, come and ask us, because otherwise we, we have too many things to do. And then it works. So um, it's time. Okay. So the next thing is, um, very quickly when you set up a project and you have uh, very many sources up and running and whatever, you get into CPU problems. Um, 
So you may want to stream your audio channel. It's very easy now to, you know, the little MADI cards which come for less than 1,000 euros or dollars give you 192 channels. So it's easy to stream 192 channels from one computer to another, which is really great, um, or even more. So you set up a local network with your IP addresses. So that's what's happening here. So that's a playback machine. It's a little Mac, uh, how's it called, a little Mac? Uh, uh, Mini, yes, Mini, thanks. Uh, which streams to the second Mac Pro, which is our Ambisonics here. Um, so the only thing I have to know that I can listen to this Mac Pro here is the IP address of the Mac Pro. <coughs> is it streaming by Dante? Um, that's streaming on top of Dante. Yeah, there's no additional that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just another tunnel, which is. So Dante is its own source, and, and it's another tunnel. And, and by the way, we are normally using UDP. I don't know if you know the difference in between TCP, IP, and UDP. So that's the two main protocols used in internet. So TCP, IP is a protocol which, which waits for a handshake. So you send a message, and the message is processed as soon as your computer is saying, hey, it's here, I got it, and you send the next message. The problem is, um, so as long as one computer to another, it's very unlikely that you lose messages because they do not drop out of a cable. But you know, sometimes like in here, it's a very complex building, so you can route everything literally to everywhere, broadband video, broadband audio, and network. So you may have an audio rendering which is sitting in some room somewhere because it's a huge computer which is very powerful. CPUs, which makes a lot of noise. You know, these computers, you turn them on, and they sound more like a chat than uh, a computer. But it's very nice, because with step machines, you can easily have 256 IOs running on one computer, but you don't want to have them in here. So you put them in a room somewhere. Um, here is a very nice routing. Everything is, is uh, fiber optics. So you route your audio signals to this computer. You open up your, uh, your network. But this network goes over some routers on the way. So there you might lose a message or whatever. So UDP um, is nice because you just don't take care. You are sending messages and you're not waiting if the message arrives ever or not. I'm, you know, it's a little bit like giving lectures. You talk and talk, you send messages, and uh, you don't care if the message arrives or not. I'm broadcasting um, in UDP. So that's what's happening. It's, it's really nice using UDP because handshake takes time, and what we do not have in audio is time. Um, so to set up Tasker to stream to another computer, you just need the IP address, which in this case would be a 10 200 6202. And now, of course, it's not working because I inserted a track message. If we could now swap over to the machine two here, please. So you see, I'm streaming out the messages. And what I get here, I was just changing the, uh, the, the IP port. And I'm broadcasting out to the second computer here over the network. And I receive my messages here. Um, what we are not have so far is a broadcasting over different IP addresses. So if you want to do so, again, you open a little, you make a little patch, you receive your messages, and then you UDP broadcast over different IP addresses. Because, of course, it could be all in there, but it never ends. There's always somebody who has another request for another very complex network setting. So um, it's not in there. So far, that's nice, because we get from this computer to that computer here, and now we can do our panoramization in this computer here. So I could now just very quickly say, oops, uh, here we are. Our little basic example. So it's the patch we had before. The only thing which changed is I inserted something which is called track, so I have first route track here. And here we are. When I change 
I'll make it bigger. And if I now change here my parameters, I change my parameters here. <coughs> and of course, if I open my viewer, that's something I could maybe do. And I move my source around remotely controlled. So that's quite nice. So you can completely remote control from a digital audio workstation your uh, computer. So the next thing is um, I would like to show you on this computer. I stop here. Ah, yeah, maybe one thing. Um, as you can see, maybe the little dot here, if I go to printing the messages, you see you get very many messages. It's a very depending, and this, this really depends on your digital audio workstation, how many messages they send in a second. And for one source, it's no problem. If you look now in the scheduler in, in Max MSP, there's no trouble. But just imagine you have a big setup with 256 sources coming, and all the sources want to move in space, and you send them in nearby control rate, uh, nearby audio rate. Then your scheduler gets a little bit, um, let's say, tired. So what you normally have to ask yourself, is it really necessary when I move a source from here to here to send 20,000 messages in a second? Um, normally not. So there is a nice object which is called speedlim. Um, so you limit the speed of uh, the messages sent, let's say to 20 milliseconds or whatever. So every 20 milliseconds you get a, a source update. Um, so always think about what makes perceptually sense um, to do so, uh, to, to send messages. Okay, so I stop here for a second and we go here to panoramics. So if I now open here, very simply panoramics, and let's say we want to, so first of all, I'm listening here in the setup. I'm listening here to port to the same port that I was listening before. And again, when I start here, oh no, now I have one problem because the port is already open. Yeah. So you should have the two ports open at the same time. So I restart panoramics and now it should work. So I freed the board port I um, was listening to. And now if I normally get in here, I receive my messages and a lot of error messages. Um, okay, that's. Ah, uh, yes, that's clear because. Yeah, that's always happening when I start up in panoramics and I'm tired. So you get this red bunch of messages and it's what the hell did I wrong? Yes, because I send a message, move track two around, but I do not have a track two. So, okay. It's just, it's, panoramics is just taking care of you to set up your things properly. Okay, so let's make a track two to get rid of messages. So I get up so you can't see it because it's behind the screen. So nice thing about panoramics is I just say, okay, make a new track. It's so you have different forms of tracks. So the one, it's just a mono source getting streamed in. Then you have multi-channel tracks, which could be a 5.1 or whatever. Then, what a nice preset. You get an eigenmic track. So the 16 channels and 25 channels uh, means just we should change it to another message which says order three or order four in ambisonics. So that's a little bit confusing still, but anyway, it's in there. You have the different, uh, yeah, that's the tree structures, not the multi-channel is another one. Or you can send, if you have pre-encoded the fifth order ambisonics, you can directly send it to a bus. Or if you do some direct mapping and you just want to address speaker six, then you can use the direct to master. So we create, first of all, a mono source. So that's our second source. So now we should get rid of the red messages here. So is 
Standalone the standalone is working without Max, yes. But, but this is still the Max console. Yeah, because it's all um, programmed. So Max is programmed in um, Choose. Uh -huh. That's the, um, how to say, the, the graphics management, the Windows management, it's Choose, which is a very powerful program language, so that's why it looks like Max. So in, in, uh, in OS X, I think, think it's still a Mac standalone we create, but there's the Linux version, which is a full standalone application. Um, I think this is still the Mac standalone, but I'm not sure yet. I don't want to say something wrong um, because it's just way easier. But anyway, you don't need Macs yeah. on Windows and on, uh, so it works on Windows and Linux and on uh, OS X. So, here we are, we have our two sources, and then now here, when I start my automation, normally it should work that I, yes. And here you see I move my first source from left to right from my digital audio workstation. So that's working. And now here we have to decide what we do with this. So now it's up to create the bus, which allows us to address, for example, our sphere in here. So you create a new bus, and here again, you have very many formats. So you can now decide, is it ambisonics in 3D or ambisonics in 2D, which is slightly different. So you do have a dome of speakers or a ring of speakers. Same for vector-based amplitude panning. Do I have 3D vector-based amplitude panning or 2D? Same for vector-based intensity panning, which is the same like vector-based amplitude panning, but you do not pan in using the amplitude. You use the energy, so the intensity. It slightly behaves differently in terms of perception, so the panning function is slightly different. Then you can send it to binaural. So you can create a binaural signal. by You can download then um, HDFs. And of course, you can do stereo, panning, angular. Then you can do, oh, that's an old version of panoramics. It's an old version of panoramics. Yes, you can do wave feed. So you can wave field K and N. So K and N is the K nearest neighbors. Because sometimes you, recently I was doing a, a show with Mark Fell. So it's a sound installation for uh, the, the Sage Gateshead in Newcastle. And we have a huge wall of speakers with 40 speakers. And so ambisonics not working because not surrounding. VBAP is difficult to think about having it from a perspective point here. So skip VBAP. Wave feed, it's 80 meters long, 100 meters long, 40 speakers. So the distance is quite high, no wave feed. Um, and so you can do some direct panning. And the final choice was a K nearest neighbor search, because what we wanted to have is that you position a source and then you blur it. So we had a function which blurs the source. And so the K nearest neighbors is just looking at, hey, I take the three nearest neighbor and then I pan in between them. And it's very nice panning, for example, just imagine that you, there's this um, system which is called 4D sound. So what they do, they have columns in the room and they have uh, speakers which play out uh, over 360 degrees in horizontal plane. And so just imagine we have a grid of speakers four by four or six by six here in the room in a regular grid. And then you pan a sound source through the audience. Sounds really nice. And if you want to do so, it's very easy. You just use a K and N. You use the K nearest neighbor loudspeakers. You pan in between them. And then you just move the source through. And you always pan in between the right speakers. So K and N is quite useful. Or when you have a grid on speakers just on the ground, um, that's really beautiful. So having speakers under each seat in the audience. And then you just move sounds. Or It's very nice when you put reverberation there. Because you feel like, wow, um, something's happening here. So put them in the dark. <laughs> it's always nice. Like, and it's on the next version. Or, I mean, no, no, it's um, just, so actually, actually, um, I came on Saturday. So normally, like last year, I came one week before. And we took a lot of time to set up the system. Because I could stay for six weeks. Uh, I came on Saturday, and we said it's safer. <laughs> not to change now one day before the workshop, all the libraries and everything we did in the last year, um, because SPAT5 changed a lot in terms of message flow and, and whatever. So this is 
The new version of Panoramics, which is the, the actual version, the current version, not the new, I should say, current version of Panoramics, has KNN, wave feed synthesis, and all the, in there. Um, so I could do a max patch here, um, which I maybe, no, we do it later on. So Ambisonics, we have 32 speakers in here. It's limited to 64. Um, in the standalone, I think it's limited to 64. Um, the nice thing is, um, but we can change this. That's easy to change. Um, so I will just remind me, and then we should change that. But if you would like to have the comfort of panoramics, and um, you can use it in a patched version. So here I'm not limited. Here I can say, especially in, in, in the new version of Max, I can use it with 700 channels if I want to. So here you see in panoramics, for example, if I open here panoramics, so you will see the same interface. It's just a max object. And if I make here a new bus, oh, sorry, new, oh, come on, new bus. And then you see you have angular pan in KNN WFS or just through. Hmm? Oh. No, through is just, you know, get transparent. So sometimes you just want to get a bus which routes everything to outside the max patch or outside panoramics in the max patch which is quite useful sometimes um, if you have different audio effects running and then you do some panoramization and then it's a bypass. It's a bypass. But you route the bypass. So you can say which signal is bypassed and which is not. A fancy bypass. <laughs> so I'm still using here the, the old version of panoramics um, just for the reason we didn't install the new one. Um, so let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of this. So. I define it here with higher order ambisonics, 32 channel. No, I said first order. Okay. Very bad idea. So you could, of course, play first order here, but um, um, you have to. Okay, I make a new bus. Ambisonics, 32 channels, and fourth order. So here we are. So one thing you shouldn't forget is to route your input signals. So channel one and channel two, for example, are routed, oh, sorry. Are routed here to my first channels. And please do not forget to push OK. We haven't solved yet the problem. If you just click, it's not taken into account. So enter does work. So you push OK, and then it's working. Um, same. So now I can say I route, let's say, the source one to the ambisonics bus. And now I say, okay, ambisonics is nice. I want my speakers to disappear from my auditory image. But wouldn't it be nice also to have um, a second source in VBAP? So I say, okay, I make a new bus, vector based amplitude panning, 32 speakers, and here we are. And I route the second one to VBAP and to ambisonics, because I want to blend in between ambisonics and VBAP. So I want to settle it, for example, to sound like coming from the speaker, and then I want in my auditor image the speakers to disappear, so I would prefer in this way ambisonics. And then, of course, I have to route here the diagonal matrix to the master, so I'm routing to the master. And here we are, we are all set, and I can have some LFE and whatever. And then, of course, in ambisonics, you have many parameters. So you could have, for example, a basic encoder. Uh, this all changed a little bit in the new version. Sorry for that. So that's SN3D, so Schmidt no, semi-normalized 3D um, normalization. The N3D normalization, if you work with a uh, first-order microphone, the sound field, you take first Malham, and that's uh, maximum normalization. So this goes a little bit too beyond, so just make sure when you receive an ambisonics file to know which normalization has been used for encoding. 
of course, we have to set up our speakers. So that's here. And then there's one thing I would like to show you. So here you can fill in your speaker coordinates. Um, it's OK when you have eight speakers to fill them in in, in azimuth elevation distance. But if you have more than eight speakers, um, you can waste a lot of time. So the good thing about panoramics is, so I now save my session here up to the desktop. And I say, test panoramics. And we, we very much believe in one thing, which is that this setup file should be human readable, which means the messages you get here, that's all your configuration of panoramics. So if I now want to fill in the coordinates of my speakers, I know that here we see it's bus one, so HUA bus one. So I search for slash bus slash one. So here you have all the messages. So the format is high order ambisonics. It has a name, which we change now. So we give it the hello world. You have the color, you have the number of inputs, and because it's fourth order ambisonics, so you have 25 input channels. You have 32 output channels because that's our array then it's all the parameters of your track. And here you get the speakers in azimuth elevation and distance. And somewhere on the desktop, we have the Studio One speaker positions here. And so what I do now, oh, OK. What I do now, I quickly configure them. NP, current file. So I get rid of all the tabs in here. Come on. Then I get rid of the break here. And then I say that's Atimut elevation distance. So I fill it in here. I save it under another name. just to make sure, because sometimes in the next editor, it's so easy to mess things up. And I load my preset. And what we see here, if I go to the speakers, I now have here the speaker array of Studio One. So that's way easier than filling in. in the... And then in panoramics, oh, that's really the old version. In the new version of panoramics, <laughs> Um, you can copy and paste the speaker set to your other buses. So there's a copy paste message. And you say the, all that metadata basically, how do you, does it automatically generate that text file? Uh, when you do save, it, it generates okay. a text file, yeah. Okay. When you save your, so actually you, you configure your scene or, or your setup, mm -hmm. and then you go to save and save your setup, and it's a text file which contains all this information. Mm -hmm. And we kept it human readable because Sometimes, actually, I'm scripting my panoramic setup. So. It is not, no. Because SPAT Revolution, so just to let you know, SPAT Revolution um, is we have a partner, which is a software company, Flux, and they make a wonderful plug out, which is called SPAT Revolution, which is, I just quickly show you the difference. So, all you can do with panoramics, nearby all. You can do also with spot revolution. And the huge difference is that first of all, it looks fancy. Um, it's, it's beautiful, but it's a pro audio plugin. So it comes for a certain price, um, not to say it's um, Aerobase exclamation mark expensive. Um, but the target, in my opinion, so the target of this product is pro audio, like film, production studios, and whatever. So it's a beautiful piece of software which allows you to have a very flexible routing. Um, it's in, princi in principle, it's a little bit like, i just show you here, a little bit like um, panoramics. 
but just in a very beautiful. So you see the panning is even, you can see the panning in between speakers. It's this point clouds. So it's beautiful graphics you get. But beautiful graphics come for a certain price in CPU power. Um, so you can, oh, it's not here. Sorry, I'm, I would have brought it, but actually. You can download it for one month for free. I just did yesterday. Mm, you can download it for? One month for free. Ah, you can? Cool. So anyone can use it for one month. Didn't know that. So, you know, you get this wonderful interface which reminds you about uh, panoramics, maybe. Um, the nice thing is it's um, Gael, who is, is the CEO and, 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 and the brain behind uh, this, developed this very nice um, Python language so you can script everything in there. So you can make a setup for life and then you get to the studio and you run your script and you make a studio setup which configures your entire um, workflow. <laughs> So it's really a beautiful piece of software. Um, so how does it work? You, so we recently made a huge recording in Vienna. So it was Disenchanted, I uh, know it was Lien uh, Kandadas by Olga Neuwirth. So it's six ensemble groups surrounding the audience. Each group is six musicians. Then it's a huge dome of speakers. So 30 whatever speakers. Um, it's a lot of electronics going on. Um, so we've been recording the entire thing with a main microphone, Eigen mic, what else? Uh, <laughs> there's no other one which Sorry. works, <laughs> to, to be honest. Um, then a lot of spot microphones, uh, which we use for live electronics, but also for recording. Then um, be, uh, above the Eigen mic, there was, no, below the Eigen mic, there was a dummy head sitting in the audience. So it was a big mess. And then we added some 5.1 trees and what you need for traditional recording and also for us. And our sound engineer just started to do a huge session with panoramics, uh, with uh, spot revolution. So what you get is a kind of plugin which you put into your audio track, whatever digital audio workstation you're using, and it grabs the audio and sends it to the standalone because it's not a plugin anymore because they do not give us enough buses. So you cannot do a huge production with 256 channels. It's impossible in digital audio workstation. So Spot Revolution just grabs the audio information, so it's a little plugin, and then it processes on whatever computer you want to process it. It can be a second computer, and then you can stream it even back into Pro Tools or whatever you're using to re-record the results. So it's quite useful. And then you can use the automation tracks like uh, with uh, what we do with Tosker, um, just to remote control all the movements and all those things. So it's beautiful to use. Uh, it's a plugin or plug out. So it's in terms of art, when you're not sticking to a standard production workflow, just working to do productions for a sphere or 5.1 or whatever you want to do, it's also a little bit limited, but it's normal, it's a plugin. So if you want to be flexible, do artwork like Bobby's doing, Bobby would not be happy with that product um, because his way of using sound in space is different from a normal production workflow. So in a normal cinema-like production workflow, it's perfect. It's beautiful, it works, it's standalone, you install it, it's a plugin, and it goes. If you want to get a little bit more complex, then I think panoramics and those little tricky helpers you then make yourself in Maximus B, or what Garth is doing might, uh, this might even work maybe somehow here. Can I just one quick question? Uh, sure. The, will it work with the, uh, because yesterday afternoon we did like a scan with a microphone, omnidirectional microphone in the middle, uh, like an acoustic scan. Mm -hmm. So will it work on that kind of system in here? That you mean uh, to use room impulse responses? Uh, actually, it was the, the amplitude the measurement. The yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yes, that's, that's something you can do in here as well. Already? Okay. I have to admit I'm not using it very often because I'm more the, the part of the world in, in, in audio that very, very quickly I, I come to the limits of this no software. Maybe yes, a day. I, I guess it's based on SPAT5, so... Yeah, yeah, it's all based on SPAT5. It's the same code base, actually. There's another product which recently appeared, which is called Holophonics uh, by... So I don't know. 
it's from a speaker brand, and it's but it's a standalone computer which provides 256 IOs, and the interface is not a plugin; it's on running an OpenGL, so WebGL, and you configure everything. I don't know. I stay with my tools, which are wonderful, because you can get this for um, up and running for a low budget. And the nice thing, as I was saying before, um, and this brings us then to, I guess it's the next talk. Um, no, it's still me? Oh my god. I should read the contract before I sign it. Um, so you put in here, for example, an Eigen mic um, in fourth order. And then I route the Eigen mic to my Hello World bus. Um, which was before named uh, HOA bus. Um, and then I can use the different encoding methods, um, which we just call method one, two, three. Um, so that's just different ways of encoding the Eigen mic. I would recommend the last one, which is method three, or even now method four. Um, so Jens will maybe talk a lot about encoding the Eigen, we'll give you some insight because there's a lot. So if you use a spherical microphone array and you listen to it and you think, oh no, that's not what I did expect because I need more pre precision in, in, in localization or the, the timber, the color is not what I expected. Do not quickly throw it away. Just think about encoding is a tricky thing. So you have different encoders which behave differently. And so that's why we provide, provide also different encoders which are not yet very well documented. Uh, but try them out, listen to them, because some have better localization, others have better uh, or provide better colors. Then you can always use this um, soft limiting regularization function, which I've shown you for the Bessel function, which blow off for high orders in low frequencies. Um, so you can limit them. That's a standard approach uh, that has been published a couple of years ago, uh, and so on. So. And then you even go on the decoding side and look what you do with the decoder. So here it's nice. Um, so when you route it to the bus here, which would be my ambisonics bus, and I use here SN3D, um, so your decoder will automatically configure to be SN3D, uh, encoder, sorry. So you don't have to take care if the eigenmic is using an encoder, which is N3D, SN3D, or whatever. Um, because we have some tools which convert the different formats to whatever format you use. So it's always the format which you define in your bus, which is quite nice. And then what's also nice is um, you could, for example, imagine you have the Eigen mic as a 3D microphone or a main microphone, and now you want to focus on the strings left hand side. Um, so to put them in the stream, and so what you can do is you just focus because it's relatively easy um, to focus there. And so, um, yeah, that's a little insight. I was hoping that I get at least some sound, but I see it's already time to stop. But anyway, um, you can try it out at home, actually, for those who stay here next week. Um, what's also nice is you can, of course, record also your ambisonic stream. So you send it out to the, to, the, to the master. And so here you see in the naming, it tells you the spherical harmonics, which correspond to your ambisonics channels. So you can record your ambisonic stream if you want to use ambisonics. And then you can, of course, sum up first order recordings, higher order recordings, spot microphones. And then recording gets to very, 3D audio recording gets to a somehow standard recording, so you have can use a main microphone, so you replace a tree by a spherical microphone array or whatever you want to use. Then the spot microphones will be here. This would be your mono tracks. You position them in space, which would be the layout of your orchestra on stage. Um, they get, if you want to link them to, to spatial parameters, they get automatically time aligned, or you can give uh, an additional um, delay if you want to you know, position them in front, which means they get more localized from a spot microphone. Or if you use the spot microphone only for coloration, then you put it in the time 
uh, or distance um, after the, the main microphone array. So it's very traditional than mixing, which you do, which you all know from 5.1. So it's not so different. But what changes is, and that's the beauty of 3D audio recordings, is the position of your microphone array. Because this is the perspective you're looking at in your recording. Um, OK, so there is, I think, a lot of low budget tools now that you cannot say anymore. I would always have loved to work in 3D audio, but I didn't have the tools. That's over. Um, <laughs> so they are there. And um, try to use them. We would also be happy when you um, have requests on I'm not saying that if you want to have something in there that we say, yeah, yes, cool, it's in the next release. But we try to collect all the requests. And if more than one or two people want to have a certain feature in there, um, I'm, I'm pretty much sure that Thibault will, will put it in there. The calibration? Um, the calibration is in here. So when you go to speaker configuration, it's a little small here, um, you can say, OK, I do auto calibration, which just takes the position of my speakers, which I was feeding in. And then depending on the position, you get a, de oh, sorry, a delay correction. So that's the milliseconds to time align your speakers. And you get a gain correction, which is here. But because you have to position in space. Okay. Not to the mic. No, but if you've been measuring it, then you could also say, OK, I give my time and I give my gain. You do it manually. And if you measure it and then just print it out in the text file, and then you can very easily find this information in the text file um, somewhere. And then, oops, here's my pass one. And then you have the delay somewhere. So speaker one delay and speaker one gain. And then you just feed it. So you print it in that format as soon as you've measured it. So with a little f, print f. And then you just copy, paste it, and reload the scene, and it's in there. And then um, if you, for example, if I want to go from my ambisonics pass to my VBAP, I would also have to set up oops, the speakers here. So there in the new version or the current version of, M, uh, of panoramics, you can copy, paste the speaker information. So there's just a copy, paste button. To have it, um, auto, so like, um, it's <laughs> no, no. Um, I don't know if it's yet in there. That's what we normally do. So when I go in a room, I set up my microphone to measure. I get the positions with also a little helper tool, as they have here, um, just a laser distance meter, and you get optimal elevation distance. And then I set up my microphone, and then I just do, and then you get delay and gain in the room. And this is automatically fed into my uh, decoder. Okay, I'm to know how to do that. Um, there is an object in MaxMSP which is called just time align, or I always forget how they. Mm -hmm. But also in, 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 in the spot version of, for MaxMSP, you have all the tools to measure room impulse responses with sweeps. Um, so there is even a patch which allows you very quickly to set up. Did you get the frequency response and all those things? Hmm? You, need you need to patch. We, we... Just wondering when can we uh, calibrate the room without patching it? Uh, normally, to be honest, um, that's the sound engineering part of the show. Um, so once you have to decide what's your mixing environment and what's your system setup. And calibration, in my opinion, it's my personal opinion, is system setup. If I work with line arrays, I'm not the guy who's calibrating line arrays. That's, that's the front of house people doing the line arrays. Because for most of the line arrays, I would be not the person who, to do it, because I would do it wrong. So there's system setup, and there's all the sound part. Um, so it's, it's the same, where should the main EQ be? Um, there's a system EQ, which is different from the main EQ you use for mixing. Because the one is more. Uh, a quality EQ in terms of timber, and the other one is just an EQ um, in terms of acoustics. So, okay, so you want to have a standalone just to measure your things that should be possible. Yeah, because video is so easy. Um, <laughs> now, 
it's of course um, I think maybe there is something in there I don't know could be even that I'm saying it's not in there and it's in there um, just look at the current version and if not there are the spot objects for for doing it very quickly so okay so I hope that this gave you a little insight on how to set up your systems um, if you work with more than whatever 30 40 sources try to have two computers up and running um, because very quickly you you get into CPU problems Um, the Ambio is in there, so when you want to use an Ambio mic, you just go into new, oops, no, you go into a new track and you say it's a direct to bus, which gets four channels. And then you make a new bus, which is then an ambisonics bus with 32 speakers in this case here, but it's a first order. Hello? Okay. So I get my bus somewhere here. Here is the bus two. And then the only thing you have to know is that you are um, using basic here, decoding energy preserving is okay. And then you use for first Malham. Um, and so, but I think in the new version there is an Ambio. Yeah. I have, might be, you've been using it. I. I'm the lucky one. I'm, I'm. It's rare that they go below fourth order. Yeah, there's, um, there's not, but there's an option for A format. Yeah, so there's an option for A format. Um. Okay. Yeah. Sure. SPAT 5, it's the limitation so far by Maximus B, which limits it to 256, no, 254 channels for whatever reason. Um, so if you want to go beyond 254 channels, um, then you may have to wait for the new Max version, Max 8, which is then unlimited. Um, I think in the current SPAT version, we still have the 256 channels in there um, because so far, it doesn't make sense in, in Max to use more because Max limited. So, but as soon as Max 8 is out, um, this limitation will not be in there anymore. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. No. No. The filter tool for the wave field. Ah. No, it's unfortunately not yet built in into panoramics because Tibu did this very recently. Um, so, but the question appeared a couple of times, so I quickly show it to you. So there will be wave feed synthesis in there. Uh, so there is already wave feed synthesis in there, but if you use ups, up. Spot five, um, what do we do? Dump, no, WFS. Ah, uh, sorry for the keyboards thing. Um, so you have a tool now which is called WFS config. Um, it's limited to simple linear arrays. Um, you could say, hey, I have 64 speakers here. Um, I have a spacing of five centimeters. Um, I want to have my reference point, but that's just something um, which comes from filter calculation, how many filters I do compute at four meter distance and then um, I said I can compute my filters for 48 kilohertz and uh, very easily here we are. Um, no, that's the config, here's the viewer. And here that's your filter set which is computed and then you just say export and it's exported. And I think the new one has then a message that you can even define um, how many points you use for the grid to get a very high resolution grid. That's in a newer version. Um, that's in the test version, I guess, because I'm using, actually TV was quickly if, that I can set up for here um, because that's not a regular speaker spacing yeah. because it's regular, but here we don't have the same distance. Yeah. Um, so I can give you a version of it where you define your speakers in a text file. Okay, yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's up to you to make it right. right. So that's always a problem when you provide tools how much power you give to the user 
the more power they have, the more questions you get. Uh, <laughs> and we are not a big software company, we're a research institution, so we don't have a huge department answering user requests. And too many user requests keep Tebow from working and doing beautiful software products. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit the trade-off. That's why very many, if it's Max MSB, you know, you just say, read the matter, do, do whatever, figure it out. So that's more people in hacking and they want to program and they always find, find workarounds and whatever. But if it's something like panoramics, then, you know, it's drag and drop and click. So, okay, other questions? Then coffee break, no? It's coffee break, cool. Yeah.